We are back. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for yet another week. Dante and I have some things to say on this episode. We have things to read, things to get off our chest, a lot of stuff happening in the world, people trying to close down polling places, and another week in America. We survived it. We are here. It is another episode, and we're so happy to bring you guys more content. We are polar opposites. If you guys are new to the show, this show is all about bringing together different perspectives. My co-host Dante and I discuss pop culture, entertainment, politics, and music, and we're never afraid of talking about controversial topics, things that might make you uncomfortable, the important conversations. We don't shy away from that. I feel like that's why y'all appreciate this podcast, because other people might run away from these topics, but we embrace it. We love it. We love it. Dante, how are you this week? What's going on with you? Last week, he said he exfoliated, so he has fresh skin. What's going on, Dante? Hey, you know, exfoliation is a great thing, um, but, you know, doing well, pushing through. We're super busy on the podcast. I'm super busy in my personal life, so it's a lot of uh, running around, but I do my best to keep myself grounded. How are you doing this week? Same, same. I'm doing good, trying to hang in there as best I can. Obviously, we have a lot to get through on this episode. (laughs) Y'all, it's a good one. So many good things to get into, but the week has been fine. You know, obviously, I try and limit how much of the news that I'm watching because it can stress you out. Y'all know during November, I was hella stressed because so much (laughs) was going on and it was hard to not keep your eyes glued on your phone and on the tv but you know i'm doing better mentally so that's all you can ask for we're progressing we're elevating and we're of course dropping more gems and giving you guys more content for free 99 for free 99 don't get it twisted it is free for now for now (laughs) (laughs) but one day maybe we'll start charging for all the gems that we drop on each episode if you guys are new to this show and you love this show after hearing this (laughs) Feel free to give us a rating, a review. I need to jump in Uh there for a second. This line isn't completely original to me, but let me tell you something. If you're going to leave us a review, right, and you give us a four-star review, why not give us a five? I'm starting to think that you a hater at that point. Like, What's the point of leaving a four if it's not a five? But that's just me. Round up. Round up. You heard it from Dante. But no, we appreciate the reviews. Like so many of you guys listen and you have not left the review. It kind of honestly hurts my feelings. I don't know how it makes Dante feel, but it hurts my feelings. If you have good things to say about the show and you're keeping it to yourself, come on. Let the world know what you think of the show. Help us get some clout. Help us elevate. And of course, you know, reach out if necessary. We have the podcast page at Polar Opposites Pod where you guys can follow us. Follow me on my personal page. Follow Dante on his personal page. Page, see what we post on there we're pretty active on there so feel free to engage with us messages those of y'all out there have done that and it's so great connecting to you guys so never feel afraid to reach out because we love you know having conversations with y'all off the pod as well so that's all i'll say be sure to also send us an anonymous question i feel like dante actually you wanted to tease this right it's not a tease i don't want to waste your time baby let's just get straight into it let's get to the action we are bringing back the segment of listener letters. I hear your cheers and applause and your sirens going off. Yeah. So me and Justin and I discussed this and Justin brought up a great point. He's a very smart guy, if you guys didn't know. Uh, and said, you know, people are going to stop writing in if we're not addressing these. We could keep teasing that we're going to do a whole episode of this, but let's break. Let's make a new segment. So we're bringing this to you. We're bringing the heat. So this is our listener letter section. We are going to answer questions on every single episode that we hit y'all with moving forward expeditiously Mm -hmm. and let's get into it right now first anonymous listener question this is for justin not for me didn't get shown any love here but that's okay how did you and dupree meet dupree and dupree is my former name so how did you and dante meet Ooh, so this is an interesting story. Maybe it's not interesting. I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts all the time. One of the episodes that I have is called Truth Hurts. So I searched that into Apple Podcasts to see how my episode is registering. And then I also came across another podcast that had an episode titled Truth Hurts. And I was like, hmm, interesting. I see black people on the cover of it. And I was like, okay, black, you know, it's calling my name. Let me check it out. So I click on their episode and I'm listening to it and I'm just laughing. I'm like, this is some funny stuff. 
stuff. So knowing me, since I have my own podcast, I understand that not everybody feels comfortable reaching out, and that's okay. But I decided to show some love and let them know that I listened to the show, that I liked it, that I subscribed, and that they're doing a good job. So then we followed each other on social media. We were messaging back and forth. When they would, you know, publish an episode, I would reach out if I felt compelled and tell them what I thought about it, and we'd continue talking that way. So a few months would go by, and that would continue. And then over the summer in 2020, Dante actually reached out and asked if I could guest on their show. So from there, we started developing our friendship. I guessed it on their show. Then, you know, in the fall, Dante, he was like, hey, man, every time we do an episode together, it's always fire. What would you think about having me on the show or would you be open to that? And I was like, no. I was like, no, I was like, no, um, long story short, you know, we start working together. It's great. And it's been great. You guys know, cause you've been listening every week. It's been great. So that's how we met. So y'all said, how did we meet? If you listen to the show, you might think that we're in the same room when we record. We are not. I am in Texas when I record and Dante is in New Jersey when he records. So we're not actually in the same room. We're miles apart, but we make it work for the podcast. So that's how me and Dante met. Amen to that, you know, beautiful origin story for this empire that we're building. Yes, sir. Glad we got to that one. All right. Next question is for the both of us. And they made sure to emphasize this for the both of us. Would you find it ignorant or cringy if a girl, you know, who is not black, starts dating a black man and begins to talk or text with a black scent? I'm like, bitch, that's my cookie. That's my juice. Okay. Carry on. Thank you. Next. That's what this baby picture says. I'll let you handle that first, Justin. Absolutely. I think that that's more than cringy. I think that that's insensitive. The thing with some people is that they believe that if they are with somebody that's not white, they get to adopt all of the characteristics of the person that they're dating or the person that they're married to. And I don't think it works that way. I think that that's weird. It's almost like people want, I don't even want to get into it like that, but it's almost like people want to be given a pass to do certain things. And I think it's a slippery slope because we see that there's some people that are black but allow people who aren't black to say the N-word. And they're like, oh, no, no, this person's cool. Oh, no, 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 this person's down with the culture. No, 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 no. Y'all know where I stand with saying the N-word. I don't care if you grew up in the hood. I don't care if you grew up with black people. If you are not black, you should not be saying that. That's just how I feel. For anybody that gets with somebody of a different race and thinks they can start being like, yeah, and yes, and talking and slang and all this, I think that that's weird. And I think that's a reflection of that person. And if you're going to continue that relationship, my eyes would be wide open, honestly. I think that you should maybe, you know, <laughs> I don't I don't know if I want to say reconsider, but you should definitely take note of that because that can manifest into other things and that's where it can get problematic. Imagine little Emily coming home and talking to her parents saying, yes, queen, <laughs> like, <laughs> please send me a video of that. So you mean to tell me that if a, a white girl is having sex with a black man and has his baby, she can't say the N word? I'm just like, no, nah, I'm just messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. That was another question we, we had. That was, that was a joke for everybody listening. You don't need to get all up in arms. Now, for the most part, I agree with Justin. If that's not who you are in your soul and your personality, then don't do it. There's no point in doing it, right? It's just, it's it's weird. Like, obviously that person started dating you or messing around with you based off of who you were. You don't need to adapt and start saying John or something like that or texting and not spelling out you and just putting you if that's what you think a black scent is. Like, no, be yourself because that person liked you for who you were. And not who you pretend to be. Exactly. And please, for the women out there who date black men and they aren't themselves black, this is coming from personal experience. Nobody's ever done this to me, but I've seen it happen to other black men. It's not attractive if you say like, don't call your your black man, you like, because now it sounds like you're trying to take possession of them. There's lots of levels to that. Love is not a possession. But two, there's kind of a long history about people owning black people. So you probably should stay away from that. And it, to me, it's just very unattractive. Like if I hear a girl say that i'm like nah nah baby that's not what it's hitting for like you're off the list no so that's just, just my thoughts on it 
No, I think that's a perfect way to sum it all up. The last thing that I'll say that's basically the theme of this question is nobody should ever change who they are whenever they get with somebody else. Obviously, Dante said it and wrapped it up with the bow perfectly, but that's hard to do because a facade can only be kept up for so long before you start to reveal who you truly are. And the mental gymnastics that you have to do to keep that appearance up, it's hard. It's easier to just be yourself. And you'd be surprised when you act like yourself, when you embrace who you are, People like that versus keeping up a false image of who you are. And some people can smell that out. Smell it from a mile away. People know. Yes, sir. So thank you for those listener letters. We will have more for you next week. Keep them coming. Yes, please send them in. It's really easy to send. We try and make it as easy as possible. For those of y'all that follow the Instagram page, if you click the link in the bio, there's a link to the anonymous thing. And also, if y'all just scroll down on this episode, one of the links there is the anonymous link for questions. So please do send stuff in and we will continue to read these. We have a lot. We have like a, a backup list of questions to get through. So we're sorry for not answering your questions sooner, but they are coming. So, Dante, it is time to get into Off My Chest. Justin's got to get it off his chest. Dante has got to get it off his chest. Justin and Dante got to get it off their chest. Thank you, Julia. So, this week in Off My Chest, Dante, I want you to go first. Thank you for sharing the floor with me. Um, What I have to get off my chest this week is this show would not be possible without all the work behind the scenes that Justin does. I appreciate that. He goes above and beyond and everything that you see, everything that you hear, like is meticulously planned out and it's a labor of love and a a passion project. So y'all should give him his flowers. And that's just what I wanted to get off my chest. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, What a great off my chest. That kind of like caught me off guard. I didn't know where you were going (laughs) to take it. I didn't know, honestly, because we don't prep each other with what we're going to say beforehand when it comes to our off my chest. But no, I really do appreciate that. You know, it might seem easy when y'all get an episode every week, but it really is hard to do. It's hard to edit. You know, it's hard to keep the content coming on the podcast page. Dante, of course, is learning some tricks of the trade, too. So he's getting more insight into the stuff that you know I did for so long by myself but it's always good to have help but no I really do appreciate you trying to acknowledge me and make sure that I'm recognized I appreciate that sometimes I just get into a trap of okay we record then we edit then we post and then we do some promotional stuff on the page and it's this cycle some of y'all might think it's surprising but I actually don't go back and listen to these episodes after we publish it I move on to the next one a week goes by we record again but with what you said just now it makes me want to take things in more slow down a little bit and give myself um, a pat on the back sometimes because I can be very self-deprecating and I never like to give myself credit or tell myself that what I'm doing is good or relevant in any way so when I hear words like that it really does mean a lot Dante so thank you for you know recognizing that and taking time to highlight me because it really does mean a lot of course of course with my off my chest I'm taking it in another direction I'm always so serious but (laughs) All right. So last week, our episode was called Stop Asian Hate because we really wanted to draw attention to everything that the Asian community is facing in this current moment. Of course, with what we've been through as black people, we always want to be allies to the people that support us. So I was seeing online, people have brought this to my attention. This isn't necessarily my off my chest, but it's definitely an off my chest for other people who might feel afraid to voice what they really feel. When we saw what happened with the guy that went into those Asian spas and killed Asian people and a collective of people, Asian people were saying, black people, y'all need to be speaking out too and, you know, helping us. And a lot of black people took issue with that. Because they called out the fact that the Asian community and the black community kind of have an antagonistic relationship, which is true. A lot of Asian people do not like black people. There's a lot of anti-blackness within the Asian community. And I think that's one issue that a lot of Asians in our generation are trying to recognize and are trying to undo. But it is an issue nonetheless. And they were saying that, why are we going to come and cape for you when y'all don't even like us? They were having a hard time wanting to be an ally to Asians when they understand the negative feelings that a lot of Asians have towards black people. So it's kind of this dichotomy of I want to support you, but at the same time, I don't want to support somebody that doesn't like me at the end of the day. 
And that's what I was seeing online. So Dante, what are your thoughts on those sentiments that a lot of people, black people specifically have towards Asian people? You know, it sounds cliche, but be the change you want to see in the world. Okay, you felt like historically we have not gotten support from the Asian community. Be that change, be that bridge, be the person that's going to reach your hand out to shake hands and build a bridge and build a relationship with somebody of the AAPI community. So moving forward, it's on solid ground and you can be there for each other because you are both of marginalized groups. Stop living in the past. If you have people who are that you mentioned our generation the age bracket that we're in now where there's Asian people at those marches after George Floyd happened. I feel like you shouldn't lump all people of a specific dichotomy into one group. So if you're on the front lines with Asian people that's out there chanting about how black lives matter in this country and in this world, you need to be there for for Asian people as well. I feel like that's hypocritical if you are not, if you're struggling with your thoughts and your feelings because there's people that stood for you and you should stand for them, too, if you truly believe in that message. If you don't believe in that message, then don't do it. I'm not going to tell you to do something that you don't believe in. Mm-mm. If you don't Dante, believe in it. I have to it, disagree. All right. Hit me with I have it. to disagree. You talked about building a better future, but you cannot build a better future until you address the problems of the past and honestly, the problems of the present. I think that black people that are feeling conflicted are justified to feel conflicted. If the Asian community has a problem that they have not addressed, they have a right to not feel comfortable wanting to stand with them. And yes, you're making it an individual thing. Of course, any individual has the power to overlook whatever their community feels and do what they think is best. But as a collective, I don't think the Asian community has rectified their relationship with black people. Look at Asian businesses. They have a lot of black hair businesses. They come into our community and profit off of our stuff. And a lot of people have a problem with that. If you look at the hair industry itself with, you know, hair that they get from India and all these places, they've cornered the market on that. Black people that are trying to establish their own black businesses when it comes to our hair, our products, they can't even get a foot in because a lot of Asians have cornered the market and won't sell to them. And this is part of the anti-blackness that these people are talking about. We are trying to make money. We're trying to survive here in America. And we have another minority group making it that much harder for us to get ahead. That's unfortunate. And that's a true thing that's happening. All right. Keep going. Keep going. I think that with all the stuff that we know about what the Asian community has done to black people, I think that they are justified. Look at Natasha Harlan in the 90s. She was going into an Asian-owned convenience store that is in her own community. She gets accused of stealing. She walks out and the Asian owner shoots her in the back of the head and kills her. In this overwhelmingly black and Hispanic area, Koreans own many of the small businesses. They're insular. They employ their own. They keep to themselves. Blacks say that's the problem. I'm not surprised that the Koreans got targeted because their prices are high, their attitude is wrong, and they just don't seem to have any respect for the black community. You know how it all started? The first thing when a girl got killed from the Oriental. March 16, 1991. Latasha Harlins, a black teenager, is shot and killed by a Korean store owner, Soon Ja Du. Du is convicted of voluntary manslaughter, but is sentenced only to parole and a small fine. The black community is outraged and remembers. These things are real. These things happen. And it's true that these issues need to be addressed. I think that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can stand with our brothers and sisters, but at the same time acknowledge that there are issues that need to be addressed. That's where I'm coming from. Well, I never said not to address any issues, but I said you can make a path forward. How? I don't think that... Like the way that you're framing it is like, okay, these things happen between our communities. So now we got to stay apart. No, because how you always. Well, that's not my sentiment. Hold on. Hold on. How you always talk about people changing and generational change and things of that nature. Right. So when this happened in the 90s, I'm sure tensions were high between the black and Asian communities. But now, like you said, at the marches I was at, there's Asian people there. If I personally know people who are of Asian descent that are at these marches and fighting the good cause for my people that are marginalized. I'm going to be there for them because I have them in mind when I'm thinking about stop Asian hate. If you have personally have a bad experience with Asian people, then you should work on that relationship or figure out why. And I'm not talking about you directly. I'm talking about people that have that sentiment. But for me personally, 
my experience has not been bad. I've seen Asian people at these marches. I've had friends that are Asian. So I'm there with you. Equated to black and white, you might have experiences with racism, but I haven't had that. So you have your issues and I don't have mine. That's exactly what it sounds like with what you're saying. You know, as a collective, there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Obviously, we know that individuals experience different things. You've had experiences with the police. I haven't. That doesn't mean that injustices aren't happening with black people and their relationship with the police. You can't individualize a problem when collectively there's a problem that needs to be addressed. And I don't think you can collectivize everything. So you're saying that because of singular events that have happened in these communities, that there is a broad overall issue. There I is have a not, broad I have, over, hold on, hold overall on. issue. What you've seen online is different than what I've seen online. I haven't seen an outcry of people saying, well, I'm not going to stand up for this. I haven't seen a, a large number of black people be like, well, you know what? I don't feel like they're there for us, so we can't be there for them. I was on this podcast a couple of weeks ago and read that quote about, and I mentioned it last week too, about, hey, when they came for X group, I didn't say anything. Then they came for Y group. I didn't say anything. And they came for me. There was nobody left to stand up for me. And I should have stood up for those people. Right. So in good faith and good conscience, you should, in my opinion, do the right thing or what you feel is compelled to do the right thing in hopes of making it a better tomorrow. I'm not dwelling on, hey, this happened in the 90s and it caused these mm-hmm. riots in L.A. Hold on. I think you're off base here. I think you're off base, but that's the beautiful no, part really about this do. podcast. No, I really do think that you're off base here because you're entitled to your own experiences, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And I think that you have to look at it for what it is. It's not enough to individualize it. Like I said previously, it's a problem. It's a problem just because you might not see it as a problem or you've had great experiences. That doesn't diminish that there's a larger issue at hand here. That's what I'm saying. There's problems between every race. So are we all just supposed to to quarantine ourselves from each other and just live in self-imposed segregation? Because there's problems between black people and white people. There's problems between black people and Asian people. That was never my solution. So so what's your solution? Because you're saying that there's an issue and you're saying that. I'm off base by trying to to make it better to stand up for people no, who wouldn't stand up for you're me. You're glossing apparently. over it. I'm not. How am I? You're saying that you're not dwelling on the past, but if you brought that to a black and white argument with all the stuff that happened with segregation and redlining that continues to this day, why are y'all dwelling in the past? Oh, that was years ago. Slavery was hundreds of years ago. That's exactly what you sound like. And that's why I was saying that you're off base, because if you're doing it with your own personal experience, you'll have a different opinion. But when it comes to Asian people, you suddenly see things differently. I have to disagree. We're still dealing with systematic Injustice, if you're talking about the white and black community. And we're still dealing with black and Asian discord. Okay, sure. So I think we have two different opinions on what a solution would be. I mean, the solution is to address it. I know what I will do. And I don't, you know, nobody's opinion is going to change that for me. You know, if there's black people that's not comfortable with it, great. You know, live your truth. Mm-hmm. I know where I stand and I know what I stand up for. Nothing would change that. I agree. Move. You can move forward, but you still have to acknowledge and address the past is what I'm saying. You can't just live in a fantasy where we're like, okay, kumbaya, we're all good, but we're not all good. There's things that need to be addressed. There's things that need to be talked about. If the Asian community and the black community wants to heal whatever divide that they have, it starts with both people. And I think that black people a lot of times always advocate for themselves. And in one of my older episodes, Steffi was talking about how as a collective, Asians culturally are not the type to you know speak out like that. She was talking about how sometimes it's like we just go about our business, you know, work hard, do our own thing. But that's a problem within their community that needs to be addressed. From what I'm saying is that it just sounds like you're wanting to just gloss over the past like it didn't happen and act like everything is good. Never. We talk about accountability on here all the time. But what we're talking about right now is six dead Asian people in Atlanta from a terrorist attack in relationships in life and friendships and sports, right? There could be somebody on my team makes a bad play. I'm mad at you, but our goal is to still win this game. So we can address that after this game, but let's go and win this game. Like you said, five minutes ago, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. So let's talk about these issues, whatever they might be, but still let's stand up for each other. 
Of course. I mean, y'all know my position on it. I'm not saying that this is my off my chest. I know that there's a lot of things that I've heard and a lot of sentiment that I wanted to give voice to on this episode of the podcast. Y'all heard last week's episode. You know that I stand with all my Asian brothers and sisters. So y'all don't need to question me or where I stand. I'm just bringing up an argument that I've seen made and I wanted to address it on the show. So, you know, we did our best to do that. But what do you guys think? Who do you agree with more? Um, What points do you agree with? Definitely let us know because I think that this could be its own episode. We have a lot to get through on this episode, but I really want to make sure that we address that on this episode. I wanted to remind you guys that in a couple weeks, we haven't announced the date yet, but we will be going live on Instagram. So if you're not following the Instagram page, this is more reason to do so. We're really interactive on there. So feel free to follow us and we'll go live on there in a couple weeks date tba but we have questions that y'all will ask and hopefully a couple of y'all will join in on the live and talk to us and see what we look like and see how we interact with each other i'm thinking it's going to be a lot of fun so i'm excited for that so i just wanted to mention that before we get into the main topics that we're getting into that live will happen when both of us are coming off a fresh haircut because i'm not going to come on there looking scraggly you know, we have an image to uphold here. So Yes, of course. We have to make sure that we look just as appealing in the artwork that we do in real life, right? Big facts. Big facts. Shout out to that cover art. It's beautiful. Very true. Let's get into the show. So, gun control. Dante, you put this at the top of the docket. Let's talk about it. Yes. So, gun reform. There were seven mass shootings over the past week. It sparked debate again on a national stage and in the government. What do we do for gun reform? Why are people dying and how do we fix this problem? And every time there's a shooting, we play this ridiculous theater where this committee gets together and proposes a bunch of laws that would do nothing to stop these murders. What happens in this committee after every mass shooting is Democrats propose taking away guns from law-abiding citizens, because that's their political objective. But what they propose, not only does it not reduce crime, it makes it worse. The senator from Texas, where Justin resides, hope you didn't vote for him, said (laughs) that the first line of his sentence was, every time there's a shooting, hard pause right there, that shouldn't be a sentence. And the right's new attack line on this is that (laughs) putting gun reform laws in place is racist and it's punishing the good people for the small few who are bad apples. This is the one time that they want to acknowledge mental health. So no, 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 he he wasn't a terrorist. This isn't we don't have a gun control problem in this country, but we have a mental health crisis that we should address, guys. Now they want to talk about mental health. They want to talk about it. When people are overworked, working two jobs to make ends meet, can't pay their health care bills, can't put food on the table. Don't acknowledge, don't use mental health as a scapegoat because it's too sensitive of a topic and too many people suffer from different effects of being in poor mental health. To use as a scapegoat for why you can't stand up to the NRA and say, hey, you know, maybe we should make it harder for people to get assault weapons here. You know, we just made it harder to vote. Maybe we should make it harder to get some guns. You can get a gun the same day. Take that thing home within two hours. Take you, what, about a month to register to vote? Between all checks and balances, depending on where you live? But I'm done. I'll let you get in there. No. Dante calls it checks and balances. I call it hurdles. I call it roadblocks. I call it barriers. They're putting all those things in place to make sure that people don't vote. We'll touch on that more in a little bit. But to address the idea of gun reform in this country, I personally don't feel like it'll ever happen. Like I said last week, it's just not going to happen. To me, it's common sense. Whenever 9-11 happened, hate to bring that up. We, as a country, said for the greater good, we're going to make it more difficult Whenever we're going through the access checkpoints before we're even able to board a flight, they pat us down. They put our luggage through all those scanners and stuff. That's a consequence of what happened with 9-11. These bad things are happening. And with the weapon that they use to commit those acts, we should make it harder for people, the wrong people. Let me emphasize that we should make it harder for the wrong people to get access to that. I feel like let's say we put in, you know, mental health evaluations and stricter background checks If at least one person, if their life is spared from a gun shooting, 
I think that the job is done at that point. That's the point, to make sure that we're safer. There's a reason why we go through all of this stuff to get a driver's license, because cars are metal killing machines. It's true. And there's a reason why there's speed limits, because cars are metal killing machines. Some people see a speed limit as a suggestion, but it's law. If you get caught speeding, you get a ticket. And that's supposed to be a deterrence to make sure that you're not speeding again and endangering the lives of other people. It's weird because nobody ever complains about all the road laws that we have, but y'all want to complain about guns. I understand that there's a second amendment in this country, but that doesn't mean that we can't stop the wrong people from getting a gun and owning a gun. I think that that's the bigger picture here. Nobody's trying to take away your guns. We're trying to make sure that the wrong people don't have access to guns. And that's pretty common sense to me, but other people obviously don't see it like that. Common sense just ain't that common in the world. Um, (sighs) We need to talk about it. We need to keep beating our chest for it. To be honest with y'all, I lost hope for any meaningful gun reform legislation after they kept letting kids get killed in schools and, you know, saying their favorite line, like let's mourn our dead right now is not the time to talk about this and grow a spine, stand up for something. And, you know, what would it take for one of them to cross out and say, Hey, you know what? Maybe this is a little out of hand. Like if one of their kids were in that school and I'm not wishing that on nobody. Cause I think, you know, I've read that the greatest pain a person can feel, and this is subjective, but is, you know, losing their child. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody, you know, rest in peace to those people who were victims of this, uh, you know, thoughts and prayers to their families. But something substantive needs to happen. So I'm tired of the thoughts and prayers. I'm tired of people telling people to not politicize it. It's not a political issue. It's a common sense issue. And when people can't seem to get that through their head, they obviously have an agenda. So uh, one one last thing on that. Yeah. Two years ago in New Zealand, there was a mass shooting. Within two weeks of that shooting, they banned assault weapons. Just think about that. Are we, I think we're past 20 years of, uh, since Columbine, right? Where the the first mass shooting of note in my time happened. What have we done since then? So just some food Mm -hmm. for thought. And look, I'm not a proponent of, hey, nobody should have a gun ever. That's not what I'm saying. I own a firearm because I'm about that life to protect me and my family. You got to, you got to admit, even the most staunch gun sport has to admit, probably should be a little harder to get a gun. Just just something to think about. Yeah. Speaking of making things harder, Segway King, <laughs> Georgia has announced that or actually Governor Kemp in Georgia has announced that, you know, he's passing what they call the let me look at what I wrote down the Election Integrity Act which in a way is making it harder for people to vote. So it's interesting because they saw what happened in Georgia, a traditionally red state turned blue and went for Biden. And they saw how Stacey Abrams was able to garner all those votes after hundreds of thousands of voters were purged from the voting rolls. So people are trembling. Republicans are trembling because they understand that the Republican Party and the ideals that they stand for are unpopular with the large majority of people. I think it's going to backfire. I think that people are only going to go out in droves and vote even more. When you try to deny somebody of something, they're going to think that they're owed it and they're going to do everything in their power to make sure that they get to you know, keep their willpower and keep the ability to vote. So I don't know. That's my opinion on it. Uh, for me, it just as a, a reminder to everyone, especially the residents of Georgia, that Jim Crow is not dead. What was passed in Georgia last week is just like the old Jim Crow laws where they had literacy tests or grandfather clauses or guess how many jelly beans are in this uh, this container here, which is a real thing. I'm not making it up. I'm not being tongue in cheek or trying to sound funny, which is a real thing that they used to require of black people. Amongst these laws that were passed, um, one of the provisions is that it's illegal to give somebody in line, somebody that's waiting in line, water or food. It's a misdemeanor. Right. So you can go to jail for helping your fellow citizen, your fellow Georgian. I think the biggest takeaway from what happened, what was passed in Georgia, is that they are not hiding this anymore. It is blatant that they are trying to suppress voters who do not vote for them. So that's young people. That's people of color. That's women. That's anyone who isn't an older white man, frankly. They also took away the power from the attorney general of the state to oversee elections because their current attorney general would not bend the knee for 45. So think about that. If the election doesn't turn out the way that they like the party in power can change the results. So Brian Kemp, instead of making it easier for your res- residents to register to vote, providing transportation, expanding the locations to vote, 
cutting down on your shameful seven hour wait times. You make it harder. And to be truthful, I don't think most of this was fueled by racism. I think it was self-preservation by Brian Kemp and the Georgia Republican Party because they saw Biden win Georgia in November. Then in January, in a special runoff election, they saw a black man and a Jewish man win statewide in Georgia. I think he did a lot of this out of his fear for Stacey Abrams in two years. Um, I get tired of talking about this because it's exhausting, but, you know, it's necessary. And I think that we just have to continue to keep our eyes open. I know that they're going to challenge this law in any way they know how. Obviously, we heard what Biden had to say about it. Um, It's obvious what they're trying to do. So I just know that Georgia voters, when it comes to 2022 and the governor race that's going to be happening, y'all go out and vote in droves and show these people that you can try and suppress us all you want. But we come out and we show out in huge numbers. So it'll be a great thing to see if Stacey Abrams runs and if she ultimately wins. We love to see it. Please continue to pay attention because one of my worst fears is that after November, you know, people are going to tune out. I've been seeing reports that a lot of the ratings for all these cable networks have gone down now that Trump is out of office because Honestly, he was their moneymaker. So now that that's not happening, it seems like people really don't care about politics. People don't like to talk about it, but we still have to stay active even when there's not an election this year or whatever. So, you know, keep that in mind, please, guys. And just so y'all know that your local elections have more bearing on your everyday life than any uh, Senate election will have or presidential election will have. So pay attention to your local politics. Read up on it. Don't complain about what's going on. Be informed about it so then you can make decisions and vote in your best interest or get involved yourself. So speaking of things that we are tired of, the I think the case or not the case, the uh, trial for George Floyd started today, right? Yep, they started the prosecution and defense started making their opening arguments today. Yep. And the BS has begun. I saw that the defense attorney said that, you know, George Floyd was killed by drugs and that's ultimately what killed him. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl and the adrenaline throwing flowing through his body all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. Nelson also laid blame on the crowd of people who gathered around Chauvin and his fellow officers and who pleaded with Chauvin to remove his knee from Floyd's neck. Nelson said the concerned onlookers were a, quote, threat that diverted the officer's attention away from providing adequate care to Floyd. I'm telling y'all, I'm not investing myself in this case. I'm going to protect my peace like we always talk about on this show. And whatever happens, happens. Ultimately, we know the type of justice system that we have. It's not a justice system as far as I'm concerned. Whatever happens, I just fear that if justice doesn't prevail, what's going to happen afterwards? That's what I'm concerned with because people today were already protesting outside the courthouse. So what's going to happen if the verdict doesn't go their way? It's going to look like the summer looked, basically. Do I think justice will prevail? Uh, We have a long, long list of history that tells us it it probably will not. That's actually something I'm going to look up after this episode. So if you know the answer to this, anybody that's listening, have they ever given an officer the death penalty for killing somebody that they were attempting to arrest? I'd be interested to know. He's he's not going to be tried under first degree murder, though. I thought no, but the I'm just, death penalty. Uh-huh. Yeah, but I'm just I'm just saying in general. I I don't have high hopes for this, especially. I don't know if the jurors know this because they're under lock and key. But especially since the family reached a settlement in civil court with the the city of Minneapolis about his death, so I don't know. I don't have high hopes, but we just have to watch it play out, and we'll watch both sides present what they feel is their truth. You know, let me ask you something, man. Because this is this is depressing to talk about. I, I don't I don't want to talk about this. This is depressing to talk. Let me ask you something. If you were an attorney, could you defend somebody that you knew were guilty? No, not like this. Not like this. This is why I couldn't be a defense attorney like that. Like, I can't do that. My conscience would eat up at me. Because honestly, I don't know. I think that people that do that, they have to really compartmentalize what they do in their professional life and what they do in their personal life. For me, those two worlds mix together and I couldn't separate the two. It would eat up at me and I, I couldn't do it. I could not defend the indefensible. So where do you draw that line? I mean, if you see an obvious murder take place on camera 
and you're saying that the guy that you're representing wasn't the reason why this person died. I don't know how you can look at yourself in the mirror. I really don't. Like, maybe he's doing it for fame and notoriety, and that's why he decided to agree to be his defense attorney. But all that stuff is not worth it for me. As an attorney, you're probably making good enough money already. But, you know, people will do what they need to do in order to advance their careers. And maybe that's his decision. I agree with you. I I think my soul and my peace of mind and my conscience is worth more than money. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do it either. Well, let's get out of the doom and gloom. We spent too much time on doom and gloom (laughs) on this episode. So let's talk about privilege. Let's talk about representation. Let's talk about Meghan McCain. All right. So if you guys don't know who Meghan McCain is, yes, McCain sounds familiar because she is the daughter of late Senator John McCain. She is currently a panelist on the show The View, and she is the one conservative on that show. So... In Congress, Tammy Duckworth, who's a senator, and her colleague, Maisie Hirono, they were saying that they will vote against Biden's non-diverse nominees because there's not enough Asian representation in his appointments. And Meghan McCain, you know, disagreed with this. Even if people are qualified to get into Ivy Leagues, race and gender is more important than your skill qualifications, the content of your character. It is not what Martin Luther King Jr. preached. I think this is a very, very slippery slope. I was very surprised to hear someone like Tammy Duckworth say something like this. She got a lot of blowback from a lot of people, not just on the right. And I think this is actually just the natural progression of identity politics. And I will say, just to put a cap on this, The View is 25 years old next year. We've only had one Asian American host co-host this show. So does that mean that one of us should be leaving at some point because there's not enough representation? Uh, We're talking about, is identity politics more important than qualifications of a job? And I think that's a question going forward that the progressive left is going to have to reconcile. Before we get into what she had to say, do you agree with them refusing to vote on Biden's picks if they're not diverse? Uh, So I just want to clarify here. We're talking about they will vote no on nominations, not on like legislation. Correct. Okay, because I don't think legislation should be held up. There's too many problems going on right now. But for picks for representation. No, I don't agree with that either. But and I'll let you finish the the point that you were going to make or, you know, the topic we were discussing. Megan McCain goes on to talk about how the Democratic Party has to rectify a lot of things. She was basically asking, are race and gender more important than qualifications? So basically, the point of her argument is that the Democratic Party focuses too much on identity politics instead of um, qualifications. So you said you disagreed with them and their take on voting based on representation and diversity within Biden's cabinet. Why do you think that? We've discussed this before. We've discussed this on an episode where we were discussing affirmative action. Someone should not get a job because they are black, because they're a woman, because they're AAPI, because they're LGBTQ plus, whatever. It should be based on qualifications. Representation does matter. More people of diverse backgrounds need to be welcomed and trained in specific fields In this case, we're talking about government appointments so that there is a ready made pipeline of talent to choose from from diverse backgrounds. And there should see it's tough, man. No hire should be made for the sake of diversity. It should all come down to qualifications. It's not. Hold on. 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 It's not a problem that you can fix overnight. I'm not in. I, I heard the question that you were asking. I'm I do not know the answer to that question. Just I don't know if there's qualified Asian people for whatever cabinet position that he is that they're talking about or discussing. There are. I'm sure that there is. I'm sure that there is. Right. But we can disagree on this. And I know we do. And we have in the past. And, you know, whatever. It could be my hill to die on. But nobody should get a job for diversity's sake. You Nobody should get a tokenism appointment or a position. Well, I don't think that that's what they're doing. I find it hard to believe that there's not, you know, any Asian people that are qualified that can take the roles that Biden is appointing for. I think that representation is important. Nobody ever simply just gets hired because they're black. In some companies, that is the case. But I'm talking about like when you're working for Congress, when you're working for the government, there are plenty of qualified Asian people to choose from. And it's just peculiar that I guess Biden thinks that none of them come from Asian backgrounds. It's good to have diversity. I really do. Because a lot of people like to think that diversity and 
picking people from diverse backgrounds means that you're only picking them because of that one quality. That's not true. It's about what their experiences can bring to the table in addition to their qualifications. That's what it is. I don't believe that the most qualified people are white people. I do not believe that. I believe that if there are plenty of people from diverse backgrounds, pick them. So you're saying that, and I just want to be clear, I'm not putting words in your mouth. This is for conversation's sake. So you're saying that... And I, I I hate that it sounds like we're picking on white people. So I'm not going to use a white person as an example. There's a black man, straight black man, that's more qualified for this role than his straight Asian male counterpart. That they should lean on the Asian because there isn't enough Asians in these positions. Is that what you're saying? You can hire both. You can hire both. That's I not, hate no, 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 talk about no, diversity. No, they like to boil no. it down to you have this one and you have that no, one. You can th- hire no, both of them. No, you can't. I, I'm in this profession of talent acquisition. You don't have two roles sometimes. Sometimes it's one role. It comes down to two great candidates. And if this is a cabinet and if this isn't a cabinet appointment, there's only one role here. You only have one attorney general. You only have one director of HUD. So you're saying are you saying that that you should choose the less qualified person because they have a diverse background if they are, in fact, Who, less, qualified? less qualified. I, no, no. See, I knew Who you were going to say qualified? that. I, you just said that. <laughs> No, you're you, you're you, tongue tying you yourself. Said, no, no, no. You just said that they. I, I'm sure there's Asian people that have this experience, and I don't think the most qualified people are white people. So what I'm asking you is that in the case of diversity for diversity's sake, right? Are you saying that somebody who is less qualified, if they are in fact less qualified, that's the example that I'm using. They are less qualified than their counterpart. They sh- should they get the job? Because what what Meghan McCain's argument boils down to is qualifications matter. Yes, they do. Over, I agree over with that. identity politics. So what I'm asking is if somebody the most qualified person should get the job. Right. Regardless of background, regardless of if you come from a background of color. No or a woman. So, OK, so the most no. qualified person shouldn't get the role. What I'm saying is when it comes to qualifications, it's not all about what you bring to the table when it comes to the job. It's about your background as well. If I'm going for a job as a camp leader and I have experience dealing with minorities for this minority camp that I'm trying to be the advisor of, that's an experience that I bring to the table. Yes, I'm qualified on paper, but I also have experience dealing with minorities. That makes me a fit for that job. That's people like to think that, oh, it's there's one qualified person that's not a minority and there's a per- minority that's not as qualified. You go with the minority for diversity sake. That's not the case. Both people can be qualified. It's about what qualities do you bring besides your qualifications to the table? What unique experiences do you have? Is that your culture and how that can help for that role? Is that, you know, who you've worked with in the past? That stuff matters, too. I hate when people are like, uh, most qualified and not qualified. It's not about the most qualified because the people that are currently in office right now that are appointed are not the most qualified. Okay, name name one. Name a position where that person is not the most qualified and who should be replacing them. That, see, now you're trying to make it a separate argument. If no, I'm can't not. Name no, somebody, I'm not. Then that means that no. there's not people listen, that aren't qualified. Listen, I'm not. What I'm saying is. Then what is the point of asking me that question? Because you said there's you. You specifically said there are people in these roles who are not the most qualified for the position. Who look at the president. Look at the former president. Do you, would you say he's qualified to be president? Nancy I'm, DeVos. I'm not, I'm not, is she, is I'm Nancy DeVos qualified that. to be in her position? <laughs> I'm answer not that. Answer that. Because we both know. How about the whatever his name is, Carson or whatever? That black man that was a neurosurgeon. Is he qualified? These people are clearly not qualified. So those are three right there. Right. Okay. I'm talking as somebody who works in this field. I don't. And okay, let's even take that out of it. I don't give a damn what my doctor does on the weekends or if he counsels the youth or if he goes uh, and hands out food to the homeless. When I'm there and I'm sick, are you treating me? That's what you're qualified to do that. Right. So there's a less qualified doctor. And he has this great, you know, humanitarian experience. Put my life in the hands of the person that's most qualified. I don't care about your your personality, your experiences. But you're boiling it down to something that's not the case. That's what her whole argument is. That's what her whole argument is. Qualifications over identity politics, over diversity for diversity's sake. I believe in diversity. I am a beacon of diversity because I work in a field where my people, there aren't a lot of us. And I actually work in a female dominated field. So, yeah, I get it. But I don't think that I should ever get a job based on the fact that I'm a black man. 
if there's well, somebody that's not who what was they more were qualified saying. than me. That's not what they're saying. They're saying that there's a lot of talented Asian people to choose from and you haven't chose any of them. You know, there's a bias there. There's a blind spot that he has. Pick these people. Okay. They're qualified. That's a good point then. If there's a blind spot there, that needs to be presented to him that, hey, here's people that are worthy of a nomination or worthy to be and looked at for this appointment in this position. And that's what they're doing by saying we refuse to vote. There's plenty. Look at all these people that you're just passing over. You need to pick them. Like, why are you passing them over for other people? That's their argument. And I see the argument that they're making. Nobody's talking about diversity for the sake of diversity. They're not saying we want an Asian there by all means necessary. No, they're obviously wanting qualified Asian people, which there are to choose from. Because people like to twist this argument into something that it's not. It's really a simple argument. It's not about somebody that's less qualified over somebody that's more qualified that happens not to be a minority. That's not what it is. But back to the my core question. They present these people who are of Asian background for this role. These Asian people are not the only people that are interviewing. And there's somebody who is more qualified. Do you still give the job to the Asian person? No, you look at everything. You don't just look at qualifications. You look at the whole picture of who that person is. That's what you do. It's not strictly about qualified because we see that in office right now, the most qualified is not who makes up Congress. Your GPA, does that encompass who you are? Does it? You have qualities that set you apart from everybody else. Your experiences, your culture, what you've done. That encapsulates who you are, not just your qualifications and your GPA. Because this is not a meritocracy. It's not. So if you are qualified and you also bring more to the table, whether that's your culture and your experiences, that makes you more qualified. All right. Okay. So, but Megan McCain, if, if, if we're getting back to what started this, you know, and talking about privilege, I mean, she got that job because her dad was the late senator from Arizona. John McCain, no doubt. you can find clips on YouTube of her saying my father for five minutes. My father, 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 and I think she chose her words very poorly there saying so should one of us step down so there could be an Asian host because a lot of people would like for her to step down. The backlash was swift on that one. And not to mention, you know, she was on TV this time last year calling it the China virus and defending 45 calling it that as well. So I think it's just ironic that the person that's least qualified to be on the panel is talking about qualifications over identity. Like you're not even qualified to be on the panel. Like look at everybody else's credentials and then look at hers. Like Dante said, she's only on there because her father is John McCain. So it is what it is. The pot calling the kettle black. You know, nothing new here, but I'm glad that she said what she said because it sparked an interesting conversation for this show. We love that, don't we? We really do. (laughs) That's why we're called polar opposites. You see, we don't agree on everything, but we are able to have constructive Mm -hmm. and intelligent conversations and we don't like, you know, get into name calling like, well, you're fucking stupid. (laughs) Yeah, we don't do that because one, we're mature and I'm never fighting with anybody when I'm making a passionate argument on this show. If I feel, you know, passionate about something, I'll, you know, vocally express myself. So, you know, y'all might be like, oh my God, are they fighting? We're not fighting. Like we're having a good argument and a lot of people, you know, have good discussions and I think that's how you get things out on the table and the people listening are probably having difficulty thinking about who to side with. I like to think that the listeners agree more with me but that's just my take dante might see things differently 100 percent, i see things differently <laughs> and that's okay that's the beauty of it you know we're free to have our opinions and we don't have to agree all the time and that's the name of the game especially when it comes to this show so um i guess one of the last things we'll talk about lil nas x has been making the rounds he you know has a music video out that's you know causing some controversy so he released a song called montero and the music video is depicting Adam and Eve, is depicting the devil. A lot of people are upset with Lil Nas X in this video. I sent you the link to watch it. What did you think about it? And what do you think of the controversy surrounding this new single of his? I feel like there's a bunch of core demos that he went <laughs> and offended <laughs> with this video. He got the, the Christian conservatives, but he came for the homophobes. He came for the, you know, <laughs> Bible thumpers. Good for him. Um <laughs> And so I think it's like 
his version of WAP and he should be able to make whatever art that he wants. The cinematography was cool. I'm not a fan of his music, but him facing backlash is dumb. You can censor. We said this last week. You can censor what your kids watch, but you would be upset if the government made that choice for you. If the if if MTV or YouTube said, hey, we can't show this video. They're taking away our rights because what happens when they do that with a video that you want to watch? You should be very careful what you call for to be banned and letting other people make decisions for you. Interesting. I think that Lil Nas X is a troll. (laughs) I think that he's a troll. I think that with the way he came up, he came up with the help of the Internet. Honestly, his song Old Town Road blew up. It went viral. And I think that he's been able to, I guess, outlast his 15 minutes of fame. I really did think that after Old Town Road that he would fizzle out. Like, this would be the one hit that he's known for. And then years from now would be like, man, remember that Lil Nas X? But now with the internet, with TikTok, with social media, he's able to parlay that into another 15 minutes, I guess. And I guess it's working for him. I thought the music video was interesting. I thought that he was, again, trolling people because that's what he seems to do. But with the conversations about, like, depictions of religion and the devil, you didn't have a problem with that as a man of faith. I say this about a lot of things, and especially people that know me personally. You have the power to do whatever you want. I am not the judge. I'm just a witness. I'm not getting offended by what that man does. That's his business. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, he'll have to answer to whatever higher power he believes in. I don't care what you do. I'm not offended by it. Doesn't bother me one bit. I was saying on the internet, so with Lil Nas X, everybody knows, or maybe if you don't know, he is gay. So a lot of people were saying that with how the media is highlighting him, they are shoving him down our throats, that there is an agenda here. Um, Have you heard of this idea of a gay agenda to, I guess, to emasculate black men by putting representations of us in the media, maybe with black men like wearing a dress or wearing makeup or having Lil Nas X do the video that he did? Do you believe that there's something out there or an agenda that's being pushed? We've all heard that. I mean, in the black community, we've heard that conspiracy theory forever. Like, yo, they put our comedians in dresses and shit, right? Like, and then, you know, you have Tyler Perry come out. He makes a billion dollars off of wearing a dress. Um and you know what? Like I said, I don't lean towards conspiracy theory. So if I'm wrong about this, we find out five years from now that I was completely wrong. I don't think it's some master plan by evil people out there to make black men look emasculated um, by putting them in dresses on TV and in music videos. Because turn on uh, on Sundays, the NFL, there are giant black men that are warriors every Sunday getting in voluntary car crashes. Uh, right now, you can go watch. Uh, NCAA basketball, black men out there playing basketball um, that are the best at their craft. So I don't believe that. Um, and in terms of a, a, a gay agenda, because I believe you mentioned mm-hmm. that, correct? I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a gay agenda. I don't think they're trying to there's somebody out there, people in positions of power that run these uh, media companies. That's like, hey, let's make America gay. In fact, I'd say that there's it's actually the opposite. I'd say most of them are trying to suppress gay representation at times. Okay, I think that's interesting. Why do you think that people believe that? Like, I feel like with the black community, there's so many people that believe in conspiracy theories and, oh, they're trying to do this and they're trying to do that. And with the vaccine, they're they're trying to put minerals and chips in it and we shouldn't take it because a lot of people, believe it or not, are scared to take this vaccine, especially within the black community. We know the origins of that with all the suffering that they've gone through and the experimentation. So we know the origins of some of that. But for the most part, black people seem to be like very conspiratorial. I think that's because a lot of times when they had thoughts and, you know, theories about things turned out to be true. Like, yeah, isn't it crazy? You find out that the uh, FBI was trying to assassinate Martin Luther King Jr. Isn't it crazy to find out that they had a whole intelligence program designed to take out black leaders? So, yeah, you know, they told you that Fred Hampton fired at the police. So that that justified them shooting at him 98 times. When actually, in actuality, he never fired a gun at him. Mm. So, I mean, a lot of things that in the black community you were told bared out to be true. Like nobody probably believed what those people in uh, Alabama were saying about the syphilis until those records became declassified. Right. So I get it. I'm not saying that I subscribe to it, but I get it. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. 
I think you made some really good points. I know the origins of where some of those conspiracies come from, but I think that as time passes, you know, the people that did wrong have to show how they've corrected those mistakes. And at the same time, we have to continue to educate ourselves and continue to, you know, take people as they are. Um, this vaccine, I think the black community needs it more than any other community because they obviously we saw were heavily affected by COVID and almost disproportionately. So they really do need this vaccine. And it's honestly, I can't force anybody to do anything. I can only encourage because I know the importance of this vaccine. The sooner everybody takes it is the sooner that we'll all go. I said, oh, my British accent's coming out. <laughs> that we're all that we'll all go back to normal. So, you know, that's my take on it. So let's talk about Lil Mama. So a couple weeks ago, Lil Mama, if you don't know her, she is a rapper. She has a lot of opinions as of late. And she was on a live on her Instagram page. And the issue of trans and children came up. So she was talking about how she doesn't think that parents should make that decision for their children. And that she's, you know, afraid for the future with people having, you know, sex changes before they hit puberty. And she said that the LGBTQ community bullies straight people and that, you know, she's under attack and that she's going to launch her own, you know, straight support group or whatever. And a lot of people, you know, roasted her on social media. But also I was reading a lot of comments and people were saying that they agree with her. When it comes to people who choose to be gay or choose to be lesbian or choose to change their sexuality with the mind frame of an adult and you're able to do that on your own, I don't have anything against you. I have gay family members. I have lesbian family members as yep. well as friends. Same. And I don't judge grown people who make grown choices. But when we're talking about these babies, we have to be very mindful about what they're being fed. Because if my niece comes to me and she say, Auntie, I want to be a boy. And I'm like, why, Chinky? Oh, because I was watching a show with Sasa, and boys are very strong. They know how to shoot basketballs. They win when it comes to, like, tussling and little fights. And I'm like, well, it does, you don't have to be a boy for that. And I can explain right. things to her that she may be confused about. But if she's telling me, I think that I am a boy, and she still feels that after she goes through puberty, I'm not going to label her insane. I'm going to listen to her, take heed, and support her. But we're talking about making children feel like they can make a choice of changing their genitals before they even go through puberty. You don't even know who you right. are or what you like. Young women right. are talking about BBLs. But I think that, you know, in her videos, she expressed sen sentiments that a lot of people, obviously, as you can see from her comments, um, agree with. I think that, you know, a lot of every side takes things out of context and cherry picks them. And it's not specific to a community, but it's interesting that she brought up people being afraid to speak their mind about things. I think that if you're, you know, if you're a person that is deeply religious and you believe that being gay is a sin in your eyes, you might not agree with what, you know, you like the, the little Nas X video, right? You might not agree with that. But how does that affect you on an everyday basis? That's that's what I keep coming back to when people bring these things up. But she lost me when she started talking about population control, when, you know, she started talking about sex changes. Can you can you touch on that? A yeah, little bit? I think that there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to the whole idea of people transitioning. Some people believe that if somebody says that they feel different, that that automatically means that the parents rush them to a hospital, get an operation done. And that's the end of it. I'm pretty sure like you can't, you know, undergo you know, a whole change like that until you're 18, from my knowledge. That's what I've heard. It might be different. I know that you can take hormones at an earlier age, but the whole, like, actually getting everything done, I feel like you can't get that done until you're 18. That's what I've heard. I don't know. I think that before you speak on anything, you definitely have to be educated about it. Of course, everybody's entitled to give their own opinions, but whenever you have a huge platform, you have to be responsible, especially when you're talking about health and things that affect people in that way. You know, you can't be over here talking about anti-vax this and all this stuff. Be well read about what you're talking about before you say it. People respect opinions that are informed. If you don't have an informed opinion about something you don't know deeply about, it's called ignorance. That's exactly what it's talking about. Like, I don't think that it's some big government conspiracy. Hey, let's make people or make target young kids to want to have sex changes so we can control the population. Some of this stuff sounds very far fetched and we need to hold people accountable like how we held people accountable about a lot of their uh, election conspiracy theories and things of that nature. The people that, you know, we don't talk about the maggots. We need to hold other people accountable. Like some of the stuff she said is very far fetched. And it sounds like, you know, she stood too close to the microwave and was wearing a, a tinfoil hat or something. I don't know. It's just, 
It just sounds crazy. And I think that sometimes you can make good points and speak solid facts, but then you throw a wrench into it when you make a stupid statement or an uneducated statement. And kind of dis- sadly, it discredits a lot of what you were mm-hmm. talking about. Do you think that that's the case with Lil Mama? I think she was vocalizing how a decent portion of people feel about being afraid to speak their minds. Mm. I think that a lot of what she was talking about, about uh, sex changes, flies out the window when she brought up population control. So, you know, is it a, a good message from an imperfect messenger? Who knows? I don't agree with everything she said, but the one thing that did stick out to me, and I'll keep saying, is that she said a lot of people are scared to speak their mind. You and I had this discussion on here before, right? Are we allowed to criticize people anymore? Are we allowed, or are we automatically a hater because we don't like something? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Some people might think that I'm a, a hater <laughs> of the weekend. Some people might think that that's I don't hate him, but I just I don't like him or his music that much. So, but I don't hate him. I don't have animosity towards anybody. I think that's unhealthy. I think that's a very unhealthy way to live life. But it's true. It can make you a hater if you're always hating on something, and then you have to unpack why. A lot of people don't like to ask themselves why they're uncomfortable with the things they're uncomfortable with. I agree. And I think that, you know, that lack of curiosity is what keeps people stagnant when it should be like, hey, let me look into this and find out why I don't Mm -hmm. like this or what about this offends me. And I understand, like I always say, I feel like with our parents community and the battle still continues, but their fight was with gay people. And I think with our generation, the fight that people are having now is with trans and gender and, you know, non-binary and fluidity. That's what we're learning right now. And I think like our parents generation, you just have to educate yourself and you can't be ignorant. You have to, you know, be open to what people are saying. Listen, listen. Listen to understand and don't listen to respond. And also feel empathy. You might not understand it. It's okay to not understand things. But the important thing is that we're learning. Because I feel like when we're educated, that's powerful. And nobody's saying that everybody has to understand it day one. You know, I'm still learning. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. But I'm trying to learn so I can be educated and have informed conversations about what we discuss. Especially when it pertains to this podcast. Amen to that. Ain't no half step. And we don't give you guys half ass effort or half ass content. But it is touchy, so. right? Because people like to put themselves in other people's shoes. Obviously, we've all seen like Dwayne Wade's kid and, you know, other people that are in the public eye and how they're dealing with having a child that is trans. So like, for instance, Dante, like for you, like, let's say that you had a kid and your son you know, said that they feel different, that they want to express themselves in a different way. And they like want to like wear dresses to school. Like, would you allow them to go to school with the dress? So I thought what you were going to ask is, you know, if my son came to me and said, hey, I think that I'm a girl. Right. And let's say my son's seven years old when he says this. My first reaction to him would be, let's make sure you still feel this way in 10 years when you're 17 and when you're 18, when you can go through and make this change official. Who am I to deprive you of your feelings and suppress what you (laughs) sorry suppress what you might feel in your heart and in your mind at that time because the world is full of people that want to see you unhappy anyway and as your parent I'm supposed to be the person that protects you and make sure that you know your happiness can flow but at seven you don't have the same opinions that you have at 17 and 18 that's why I think that I that's how, how I would lay it out to my kid is let's make sure you still have these feelings I'm not going to discourage you to do anything. I'm going to do my best to protect you and support you. That's that's the best I can say about it right now. Like, I don't have a kid right now, so I can't. You know, it's hard to do hypotheticals about having kids when I haven't created one of my own. But I, I think where I'm at right now in my life is I'm going to do what I can to support you and protect you. That's all I can keep coming I mean, back that's to. That's support and protect, I think, is what all parents should do. And I think also educate yourself as well. Um, obviously, nobody wants to make drastic decisions when it comes to getting operations done, because sometimes it can be permanent. And you don't want to ever be in a position where you went through it something and then people have regrets. But I think that it all starts somewhere, to be honest. Chopping your dick off is, is permanent. <laughs> there ain't no getting that back. <laughs> yeah, I do think it starts somewhere. I do think that whatever your kid is feeling is valid. And when it comes to expressing it, because that's one of the things that she was talking about in that video that she said, like, how would you feel like if you had a kid that was feeling like that and they said that they wanted to express, you know, their identity the way they feel? Let's say he wanted to wear a dress. Would you allow him to wear a dress like if he's going to whatever if he's going to if he's going to go do that as his dad, I'd break out a 
the baby dump trucks and make sure you know how to fight because you know that there's going to be people that's going to pick on you. So make sure you know how to defend yourself and don't take no shit from nobody. You can't let nobody uh, prey on you because you want to express who you really are. I don't support that. So if that's the choice you're going to make, just make sure you know how to defend yourself. I do wonder what's going on in school these days because the issues that we went through are different than the issues that other people are going through right now. So I do wonder how kids are being treated right now. I can imagine, but, you know, obviously I'm not that young anymore, so I don't know. But it's interesting. I just hope (laughs) that with education, with everybody having access to social media, people are choosing to free themselves of the ignorance and the bullying and are sticking up for people and are trying to educate each other because we're all learning at the end of the day. And as a parent, it's hard to be a parent. Things are changing and you have to adapt to the change. You have to learn. And that's that's life. You can control certain things and other aspects you can't control. And I think if you want to have kids, you have to be open with that being a possibility. So that's my opinion on that. But yeah, <laughs> this has been like a lot. Yeah, we gave you all a lot of free 99 content. Um, Justin, I think it's time to wrap this thing up. Yes. So before we go, I just want to say, Um, I appreciate you guys. Like we mentioned earlier in the episode, we do have an anonymous thing for you guys to send in questions. Of course, we have our, you know, social media links in the description as well. So feel free to follow us. But I really do appreciate you guys taking time out every week to listen to this show. So continue allowing it to grow. Share it with a friend. And of course... I was about to say something like Ellen. I was about to say be kind to one another, but they cancel Ellen. So (laughs) let me not say that. Let me just put it on Dante. Take us home. Take us home. All right. We are Polar Opposites. Thank you so much for the love, support, the interaction. Tell your friends to tell their friends about it. Go listen to our episode. Subscribe, download. We'll hit you with another one next week. Listener letters are back. Go write an anonymous question. Thank you for listening and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.